Welcome to Rogue Trader. Please read the disclaimer and remember that prices can go down as well as up. Hello and welcome to Rogue Trader. And today I'm doing a commodities roundup video. Last year I did a stock screen of all of the UK commodities companies. And the original list had well over 100 stocks. And I went through and narrowed them down to these. I did this using the Reuters website where you can go through individual stocks and have a quick eyeball on their financials. And so using Beowulf Mining as an example, as you can see, no revenue, cash burn here of a million a year. So it was quite easy to uh, narrow down to stocks with at least sound fundamentals. Of course, this list was still too long. So I then went through each stock individually and weeded out ones which were mostly exploration or had patchy finances. And then this left me with these 11 stocks that you can see in white. Now I'm going to go through my investment story with all of these 11 stocks. But first of all, let's have a quick recap on the, the general commodity theme. So starting with oil, according to the IEA, oil demand is set to increase for years to come. So I'm here on the International Energy Agency website. They're environmentally biased, but they're still, in terms of the hard data, a reasonably neutral website. And as you can see, oil, oil demand is forecast to com continue going up above the pre-pandemic levels. And this is the trend that we're seeing. It's interesting that even if you go back to 1990, there's this continued increase in the amount of oil being consumed. And it's mostly for motor vehicles. Now, although it is true that there's a move towards electronic vehicles rather than motor cars, actually what we see is that in many parts of the world, there will, st there will be an increase in the amount of motor cars being uh, produced, particularly in countries like India, and also a lot of hybrid vehicles. So we can expect the amount of oil consumption to increase exactly as forecasted by the IEA themselves. On top of this, there's a clear energy crisis at the moment. In fact, Joe Biden himself is, is, uh, quite, is using the term energy crisis only recently. If you take a look at my Greta Gold stock series I did, I go into a lot more detail there in the roundup video. But essentially what's happened is governments have made it as painful as possible for oil and gas companies in recent years. And so these, com these companies have stopped really, have stopped investing in new oil and are instead just paying out massive dividends and share buy and doing share buybacks for their shareholders. But because of this lack of investment, the amount of oil being produced is started to become under threat. So we're in a situation in the next five to 10 years where oil consumption won't have dropped as, as some people expect, but the demand will still be there, leading to a severe oil crisis. And, I've, and I think everyone's aware of this at the moment. So I think there is a very strong case for oil prices to go up in the next five to 10 years. And the great thing is using BP as an example, you can see that the stock prices are still low compared with before the COVID crisis. So whereas almost every other asset class, the price is above where it was before COVID, using how with oil stocks, you still get a real discount, even though green leaning agencies like the IEA are saying that we're still gonna be using more oil in the future. There's definitely a good bull case for oil and gas with the caveat that of course in five, five years time you'd, you'd then have to reassess what's going on with the ev vehicles but certainly in, in a five-year time frame it's very attractive to invest in oil and gas so lead is used mainly for car batteries and here i've got the uh, the amount of the predicted amount of cars to be manufactured up to 2030 and the interesting thing is that ev vehicles is only really still going to be a fifth of the total come 2030. And actually there will be an increase in the number of motor vehicles. Now EVs do actually use lead batteries, but smaller ones. Uh, hybrids use lead batteries and obviously IC, IC engines use lead batteries. For the foreseeable future, there will still be a demand for lead. We could perhaps call the overall case for lead as neutral. Mineral sand are used for pigments, mainly in paint and plastic. 
there's a well-established correlation between the price of mineral sands minerals and GDP growth. Now, the IMF expects GDP growth to continue to grow. And the important thing is, is that the the general trend in the world is that some of the developing countries are growing their middle class. And what we find is, is that as you get a higher GDP per capita, the amount of mineral sands consumed increases. So you've got here the Western Europe, North America and Japan. And so as these poorer countries get shifted to the right here, we expect, we expect to see an increased demand in mineral sands around the world. Copper, I'd say, is my favourite commodity, because apart from oil. It's getting harder to find commercial grade copper. We've got a graph here of the average copper grades throughout the world. And as you can see, it's substantially been dropping as existing resources get used up and it's harder and harder to find decent res new resources. Also, exploration has been rather underdeveloped in recent years. When the world starts trying to create new copper mines to, uh, to meet its requirements, it actually takes 10 years to develop a new mine. So there really is like a, a short term and a medium term bull case for copper. And from my sources, there is expected to be an increase in copper demand, particularly as the developing world starts to get more middle class and then they're going to require more electricity, building of more electrical infrastructure and more people having cars. But also, um, although a minor component, you've got to think about the energy crisis and the fact that there's going to be lots of wind turbines being built and the fact that the entire electrical infrastructure in the Western world is going to have to be rebuilt and scaled up probably by a factor of three in order for us to cope with dealing with the erratic electrical source from wind power and solar rather than the kind of high base load situation we have at the moment. The investment that's going to be needed in transforming the electrical infrastructure in the Western world is also going to need lots of copper. China accounts for 36% of the uh, total copper consumption. So in the long term, that's quite attractive because I expect, I'm kind of a bit worried about a China downturn. When I compare it with other commodities like iron ore, for example, China isn't too big a piece of the pie for us to worry about the medium term growth of China. But overall, once we get over short term risks, such as the the follow on from the Evergrande crisis and, and China clamping down on its internal growth strategy. I do think that copper is one of the best commodities. So for each stock on my shortlist, I did first a blitz analysis video, which you can see on my initial commodities stock filter. And then for the ones that passed that test, I did a full video analysis on the video page of my YouTube channel. You'll see my initial stock filter video there plus all of those stocks, which I then did detailed videos on. So here's all of those stocks represented dividend yield against price to book ratio. And there was an interesting delineation where the mineral sands had the lowest price to book ratios. Then the oil and gas companies had in the middle, but still very low price to book ratios, but really nice dividends. And then the large mineral metal miners had the highest price to book ratios, but also varying, but generally good dividends. Now, I was probably a bit lazy, but with Anglo-American, I decided to count them out and concentrate on BHP and Rio Tinto. They were all big cap resource stocks. So I just decided to make my job easier by concentrating on these ones with a higher dividend. Now, Antofangasta, they're all copper and they're based only in Spain. Again, I was a bit lazy discounting them out and maybe I should have done full videos on these two, especially where Antofangasta are all copper, especially where Antofangasta are all copper. But at the time, I was expecting these to be, you know, fairly clear cut. So that's my excuse. Central Asia metals look great at first glance. So I did a video on them. They're based in Kazakhstan and North Macedonia and half of their portfolio is copper which i think is great plus zinc's good as well you can watch the video i did on them but this is a solid company i really like them and actually i was just about to buy shares in them 
when Russia invaded Kazakhstan following all of the uh, turmoil there. So what with the Russian invasion, I stuck them in my watch list. Base Resources were a very interesting company that I took a deep look into. They produce mineral sands, and I found out that all of their production is currently in the quail operations in Kenya, but this will be running out in 2024. Now, they have rights to a massive mineral sands project in Madagascar, which if it goes ahead, to me, if that went ahead, you'd be looking at a five to tenfold increase in their share price. But what happened is, is that the government there put a complete halt to all their operations there because of political issues. It's one of these African dictatorship situations. And I think there's a very great risk that that project will never happen. So you're stuck with their quail operations, which are running out in 2024. And this explained why they were paying out 22% dividends. Essentially, this company's in a default liquidation state. So if the worst case happens and this Madagascar project never happens, at least the shareholders are going to get paid back all their money by the time the quail operations close down in 2024. So I had stuck them on my watch list. I think they're excellently managed. I've been very impressed uh, by how they run things. And if they come up with some new development somewhere else, or if the Madagascar operations go ahead, I'll definitely be very interested in investing in them. BHP Group were very complicated when I looked at them. They do all of this resource trading as a lot of their revenues, as well as just producing resources. I decided to just focus on Rio Tinto because they'd be better to understand with a similar profile and paying a better dividend and having a better price to book ratio. For Expo were low dividend and iron ore only, and all of their mining operations are in Ukraine. Enough said. Kenmar Resources are based in Mozambique, and when I started to look into the country, I saw that it was home to an ISIS terror insurgency. Contractors being killed recently in uh, insurgent attacks, so I decided to steer clear of Kenmar Resources. So Rio Tinto were a very impressive stock in terms of their financial performance and their dividends and everything. The problem with them is that most of their resources are iron ore. And it's a great shame that they sold off their uranium and coal assets. So unfortunately, all this iron ore, it makes them an iron ore one trick pony. So I looked into their future developments and that's going to be the case for a long time. So I actually bought Rio Tinto at the top and the price subsequently plummeted. And this was actually more than anything else down to the Evergrande crisis. I go into it more when I, in my Rio Tinto video, if you want to look at that. There's been a massive housing bubble in China. Most of the world's iron ore was getting imported into China. And now that they're not building houses anymore, that led to a crash in the price of iron ore. Actually, the price of iron ore and Rio Tinto has been shooting up after I sold them, of course. But I wouldn't say we're definitely out of the bear market yet. Now we're in my watch list and I feel like I'd really have to establish what's going on with iron ore and uh, the reverberations following Evergrande before investing. Now, I was very impressed with BP. They've got a very pragmatic approach to the energy crisis or the, you know, the environmental concerns that's been piling loads of pressure onto these companies. They are investing fairly heavily into renewables, but I don't think they're overdoing it versus Shell, for example. Also, they're investing heavily into the EV charging. And so in the future, all of these people who don't have off-road parking, they're presumably going to have to go to garages to get charged. And while they do it, they're going to have to go and buy a newspaper and a cup of coffee while they wait for half an hour for their car to get charged. So I do like it how BP are turning one negative into two pluses here. They are doing a lot of divestments, but focusing on the less profitable parts of their business. And there will be significant new investments into higher margin oil projects. So overall, I like their pragmatic approach. I bought BP in June last year, and I was very sad to have to sell them last month. In my research, I'd uncovered that they own 22% of the Russian company Rosneft, and actually half of their hydrocarbon reserves are owned via this stake in Rosneft. So sadly, with the Ukrainian invasion, I think that there's a big risk that if there's sanctions on Rosneft, 
that's going to really hurt BP. Of course, there is a chance that the UK government won't sanction Rosneft to protect BP because the sanctions have been fairly weak so far. But still, I feel like I have blood on my hands if I own BP stock. So I am glad I've sold my shares. Now, I can't invest into Shell because their boardroom is being commandeered by environmental activists. There is one other stock that's a big oil stock listed in the FTSE, which is Total Energies. Unfortunately, I can't invest in them. They're actually a French company who also list on the FTSE, and they're one of the stocks that my bank won't let me buy. But I am looking into opening a share dealing account, especially so I can invest into Total Energies because I really do want to get back onto the oil train. Diversified Energy are a very interesting company. They're all natural gas, which is the best of the fossil fuels. And what they do is they basically take on loads of debt and then buy up aging gas resources from other companies in the US. They hedge their profits so that they've got a guaranteed income in the long term and then pay back massive 12% dividends to shareholders. They're well established now and a very impressive outfit. This slide taken from their investor presentation shows how they do their hedging. The stuff in the red here is unhedged volumes. And you see that really the majority of their of their future production is hedged. So they guarantee a fixed price for their gas going forward decades. Really, it's going to be at least four or five years before you start seeing them being able to up the value of their assets by increasing the price of the hedges. So because of the hedging, they are essentially to be looked at not as like a, a future play on commodity prices, but just as a good solid company, you know, and really a great place to park your money where you're going to get really nice returns of 12% dividends every year. And this can be shown by their share price. It only really deviates from... 15% either side of the average over a long period of time. But they're sure a very interesting company. And I've put them onto my watch list as a solid company, which I think is a great place to park your money for 11% dividends. Finally, Royal Dutch Shell, they had a lower dividend yield than BP. They seem to be throwing everything but the kitchen sink at the transition to renewables in a way that I don't think is good for the shareholders. That's why I originally opted to go for BP instead, and now I'm turning my focus onto Total Energies. Central Asia Metals Limited, and the, the actual political unrest has completely blown over now. But the government of Kazakhstan, they're still gangsters, Soviet tribal gangs, gangsters rather than local tribal gangsters. I would have another good think about are there any risks to UK companies? But my kind of feeling is that whatever happens over the Ukraine crisis, probably going to be like an arm's length connection to Russia. So the West will will still be able to access the, the commodities from Russia. And Kazakhstan is practically Russia now, let's face it, through this proxy country under the influence of Russia, despite whatever goes on in Ukraine. But it certainly needs some consideration before investing in them. Base Resources is an excellent run company, but their future prospects hang on government approval of the setting up of these operations in Madagascar. And I consider the 22% dividend is essentially a liquidation default state that this company is in. Whereas the major shareholders who dominate ownership of the company will get all their money back by the time the, the current resources run out. So they're one to keep an eye on and then invest if we see a change to that. Rio Tinto are totally an iron ore play. And before going back into them, I think we need to get past the short term macro uncertainties and pay special attention to what's going on with iron ore prices as the Evergrande crisis patters out. And then diversified energy, I'd like to take a real good look at their indebtedness because they are highly leveraged. But otherwise, I really like them as a company. Um, and with the hedging though, you should consider them not as a company to invest in for an increased share price, but as a great place to park your money for a nice 12% plus dividends. Now, when I first started doing the commodities videos, I wasn't doing any sector analysis, but along the way, this is something that I learned. And it's something that's now actually a main plank of my investment analysis 
when I look at stocks. Now, when we look at the when we look at the commodity sector over the last five years, really there's there's kind of two trends you could you could say. One would be that we're at another high, then they're going to go down again. But the other is that there's a long term linear trend upwards because commodities are things or atoms taken from the ground. And essentially, in the long term, you get inflation. Plus, with globalization, there's been an increased trend in economic growth around the on, around the globe and more people needing more commodities. So it just kind of makes sense for there to be a long term linear trend in the commodity sector in line with global growth and inflation. However, would you want to be investing now with that being the best case scenario? And there being other scenarios, not really. You want to be investing down here. And where I kind of feel with commodities is that I joined the party too late. And, you know, if I'm investing now, I'm investing whilst everyone else is knowing about it and investing in commodities. Having said that, I am kind of I am long term positive about commodities, but but still I can't I can't overlook, you know, that fact. And what I'd say is if I do invest in commodities and by commodities, what I mean here is metals and mining in particular, I'd have to convince myself that there's a long term linear trend upwards. Now, with oil and gas, however, and we know I showed before that the amount of oil being used now is more than before covid and there's an energy crisis so actually the, the price of oil and gas should be increasing in the coming years in light of this it's amazing that the oil and gas stocks are still down here well below where they were be pre-covid so i think there's definitely um, scope for further uptrend when i look at the sector profile for oil and gas and here you don't feel like it's as risky jumping on on a on a bull trend the same as you do here for commodities when you when you look at the overall patterns so i am overall feeling from the sector analysis that i'm too late in the game for the for the metals but i'm still very interested in um, investing in oil and gas companies particularly when you consider that all the politicians now all they talk about is the fact that we're in an energy crisis now even before it's fully underway and we're still down here i've got a lot of conviction investing in oil and gas at the moment so to summarize my conclusions i feel like it's too late for the the metals commodities party and one of my general learning points from last year is that i need to be investing in things when they're completely out of favor and no one's talking about them than when they're rip roaring through a bull cycle if i can convince myself that the the longer term linear trend is up for metal commodities caml look good diversified energies also look good as a uh, en as an energy stock but mainly as a place to park your money for great 12 percent returns every year but let's say i'm considering buying a couple of commodity stocks i feel a lot happier buying a couple of oil and gas stocks than a couple of uh, in metal stocks and with one of them potentially being diversified energy then the only other energy stock i can invest in that meet my general criteria for for stock size and and st profitability and stuff is total energies so by default for me to get back onto the oil train and i definitely want to get back on the oil train i plan to take a, a thorough look at total energies before investing in them later in the year so that concludes my commodities roundup. Thanks very much for watching and, uh, and good luck with your trading.